Amen. That's the gospel. <laughs> that is the gospel. If you have a copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to turn with me to John uh, chapter 15. John 15, and we'll be looking at verses uh, 1 through 17 together this morning. Uh, if you are new to the Bible, uh, John is in the New Testament, and it is uh, the fourth book of the New Testament. So it's the fourth of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 15, 1 through 17. Uh, it's become somewhat of a tradition uh, for our family that in the fall uh, we take a trip uh, up north, uh, try it not too far up north. Last year we made it all the way to Menton, Alabama. Anybody ever been to Menton, Alabama? All right, it's a nice place. You should go. It's kind of like Gatlinburg isk, all right, without all the uh, tourist attractions and whatnot. Uh, but this year we are uh, going to go there to Gatlinburg. And I Googled last night, or no, it's been a few nights ago, like how far is it from here to there? It's like six hours. So, uh, Pray for us, church. That's what I'm asking. I'm asking for prayers. Uh, we have four little ones. Uh, so pray for them that they would be patient with us. Pray for us we would be patient with them. I feel like this needs to be a reciprocal kind of a thing. Uh, but I realize, you know, it's so easy to find places that you want to go to nowadays. You just um, consult the Oracle, uh, Google, and Google tells you everything that you need to know, right? I realize now, whenever I want to go somewhere, I just punch it into my phone, and I just drive mindlessly, and then... When it says turn, I just turn. I don't even question it. I mean, this thing could be taking me to Tucson, Arizona, but I have utter confidence that it's going to get me to where I need to go. And, it's, and for the most part, it's done that pretty well. Uh, 90% of the time, it's accurate. Uh, but before you uh, would type it into your phone, you guys remember the days when you would go to mapquest.com, type it in, print out the uh, directions, and then the passenger had to be super careful to make sure that they didn't miss the exit, Right? Okay, so you're kind of doing that number for six hours. But even before MapQuest, has anyone actually used a, a paper map to find where to go? I don't think I could do that <laughs> if it was up to me. But we use all of these things. We use maps, we use MapQuest, we use phones, if you're normal. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, to find our destination, right? The place where we want to go. I have a question for you this morning. Uh, do you have a destination-only view of Christian conversion? Do you have a destination-only view of Christian conversion? Well, Drew, uh, what do you mean by that? Maybe I could answer the question, okay? A destination-only view is where we speak like the only purpose in conversion is changing our eternal destiny from hell to heaven. And that is gloriously true, by the way. That's not a little thing that we were going to go to hell and now we're going to heaven. But Christian conversion isn't only about changing your destination in the future. It's about creating a new you in the present. It's about living a transformed life right here, right now. In other words, the reason why we get the benefit of going to heaven is that God makes us a people fit for heaven by virtue of His work. Now, our passage this morning is going to show us why it's so vital that we understand this, because I think there, there can be quite a bit of confusion around what is the essence of the Christian life. For example, you, you, you Christians say that we're saved by faith alone, but now I read in the Bible that we're supposed to obey God's commands and do good works. So what gives? Which is it? Are we saved by faith alone, or are we saved by our works? Or you Christians say that we just call on the name of the Lord and we'll be saved and that's it. But yet I see so much in the Bible Jesus saying, take up your cross and follow me. That seems like there's more than just calling on the Lord there. It seems like there's a, a lifestyle change that comes along with this. So what is it? And what John 15, I think, does so well for us is it helps us to understand the order in which conversion happens and then also how good works, the good works that we do, how it relates to conversion. So what is the relationship between them and why good works are necessary for salvation, but not in the sense that you might think, okay? So is that enough of a teaser? Should we just go ahead and read the word? All right, let's do that. I think that's better. John 15, verses 1 through 17, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me... You can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, Jesus, this isn't really a parable. It doesn't technically, I guess, meet some of the parameters for a parable if you're into that kind of thing, but it's more of like an analogy. Jesus compares himself to a vine, and then he says, The branches are who? <laughs> right? Me and you. So, we are the branches, and God is the vine dresser. He's the one who prunes the vine. All the branches that are not going to bear fruit, those are going to be taken away. Those that do bear fruit, he's even going to continue to prune those so that they may even bear more fruit. But notice that Jesus doesn't say, I'm the vine. He says in verse 1, I am the true vine. What does he mean by that? He's actually picking up on the Old Testament storyline. So you guys remember when I read Isaiah 5 earlier, there's a method to the madness there. So all throughout the Old Testament, God's people are likened to a vine. And God is the one who planted this vine and grew it. And God expected that this vine would bear fruit. But unfortunately, as you read through the Old Testament, what you see is that God's people failed to bear good fruit. Instead, they they bore bitter fruit like worshiping idols. And they bore bitter fruit like oppressing widows and orphans and foreigners, exploiting poor people for their own financial gain, or uh, what else? Gosh... Sexual immorality. I mean, there was just all kinds of things that were going on. And so they bore bitter fruit. And so what Jesus is saying here, when He shows up and says, I am the true vine, is that now God is building a new people through Christ. A people who will bear fruit for God. Fruit that is pleasing to Him. And so in this passage... Jesus lays out four characteristics of God's new people. If God is creating a new people for Himself through Christ, then what should this new people be like? What should characterize them? I think we see four in our passage this morning. Here's number one. God's new people are cleansed by the work of Christ. God's new people are cleansed by the work of Christ. Look with me in your Bible to verse 3. Jesus says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Okay, so what does Jesus mean by this word that he has spoken? What's that in reference to? Well, I think one way to answer that question is think back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the who, church? Word. And who was the Word? Who is the Word? It's Jesus Christ Himself. 
So Jesus is God's Word. Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father. That in Jesus' ministry, He was revealing God's plan of redemption. If you remember a couple of weeks ago when we uh, resumed this series in the Gospel of John, we talked about how beginning in John 13, Jesus is going to teach, 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 and all of His teaching is going to point to what? Here's a hint. To the cross. All of His teaching is going to point to the cross. And so... What Jesus has just told his disciples here is that you have been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. And that word is the word about my death on the cross for you. That you will be cleansed through my finished work on the cross. And it is so important that we get this, church. Here's here's bringing it into today. Discipleship to Christ does not begin with what we do. Discipleship is not a list of things that you have to check off. At least not to begin with. Discipleship does not begin with what you do. It begins with what Jesus did. In other words, if the cross never happened, then there would be no Christians. You and I are Christians primarily because of the work of Christ not our work. Amen? That's the starting place for Christian discipleship. It is at the cross of Christ. It is in His finished work. And then everything else in the Christian life flows from the cross and then finds its life in the cross. You can think about it like this. Another analogy, Jesus is using the vine here, but earlier in the Gospel of John, uh, He used the analogy of being born again. You guys remember this from John chapter 3 when He was in His conversation with Nicodemus? And Nicodemus is like... Hey, just want you to know, the Pharisees think you're a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah. We, we think you're, you're you know, worth our time and conversation. And what does Jesus say? Like, oh, gee whiz, guys, thanks so much. I just, you know, I've been working at it, and I'm just so glad to know that I am validated by you. No, Jesus goes, unless you're born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You want to keep talking? You want to keep this conversation going? And so then Nicodemus is like, oh, come on, man. Surely, you know, and then he goes into the grotesque imagery there that I will just leave to your imagination of what it might look like to be born again. But we know that Jesus was talking about being born of the Spirit, that when we place our faith in Christ, that we are born again. And that's where the Christian life begins. Think about in your own life. Your life did not begin with anything that you now do. Your life began with you being born You were born. It's something that happened to you. And now in light of your birth, you're now living your life, right? Same thing with the Christian faith. We are first born again of the Spirit, and now we live the Christian life. And that order is so, so important. Discipleship begins not with what we do, but what what Jesus did on the cross. God's new people are cleansed by the work of Christ. And it is in light of their cleansing that they are called to persevere in Christ. That's characteristic number two of God's new people. We are cleansed by the work of Christ, and now we are called to persevere in Christ. There's a word that you may have noticed Jesus repeats a ton in this passage. It begins with the letter A, and that word is abide. Seems like every time you turn around in John 15, Jesus is saying, abide, 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 abide. You know, it's one of those words that starts to sound weird the more you say it. Have you ever done that with a word? Like, wow, that's a weird word. Abide, abide, abide. (laughs) And he says it so much that you start to kind of have that feeling in your soul. Like, man, we never use this word, do we? Your text may say something like remain. And that's, that's a great translation too. Because it really captures what is the essence of saving faith in Christ. It is in light of our being cleansed by the work of Christ that we are now called to persevere in our faith in Christ. And that order is so important. And that's exactly where Jesus goes next. Look with me in verses 4 through... Or no, excuse me. Um, Look with me back in John chapter 6, and I'm going to try to explain this. Because Jesus says clearly that if we do not abide in Christ, then we are showing that we're not connected to the vine. Has Jesus just taught that we can lose our salvation? That you were once connected to Christ as a branch, and then you voluntarily 
disconnect yourself from that branch. This is where we can't push the analogy too far, but what Jesus is saying, and this is where we take the whole Gospel of John to understand what he means in this passage. But throughout the Gospel of John, there's been this emphasis that genuine disciples of Christ will persevere in their faith in Christ. Whereas non-genuine disciples, that is, fakes, phonies, not real disciples, they do not persevere in their faith in Christ. And so John chapter 6 gives us a beautiful illustration of this. John chapter 6 is probably my favorite chapter in all the Bible. You know why? Because Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. He's given them bread. They're so excited. And the next day they show back up. And they're there with Jesus. And I can almost imagine the disciples saying, Man, we've really got momentum here. This would be a great time for him not to say some of those weird things that he likes to say. Like, Jesus, just keep it between the mustard and the mayonnaise, huh? Just, hey, God's love, right? Just, that's all you got to do, man. We got him right where we want him. Jesus with a twinkle in his eyes, like, you got it, you got it. All right, hey guys, listen up. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Who wants to follow me? And look in verse 66 of John 6. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Showing that they were never truly connected to Christ as a genuine disciple. Genuine conversion begins in a moment and then lasts for a lifetime. But what I'm afraid of, church, is I am afraid that we've gotten really good at collecting decisions for Christ. We've gotten really good at committing people to pray a one-time prayer and not stressing to them that the Christian life is not found in a one-time decision. The Christian life is a continuing in that new faith in Christ. It takes place in a moment, yes, but then the genuineness of it is evidenced through a lifetime of trusting in Christ. That it continues on. And I'm afraid that there are many, many people who have prayed a prayer who are just sure as the world that they're going to heaven. And who have continued their love affair with the world and show no evidence of the Spirit of God dwelling within them. No love for the things of God. They continue their love affair with the world. And I'm afraid it will be those people who, like Jesus says in Matthew 7, He will tell them, depart from Me, for I never knew you. And so it is incumbent upon us, church, that as we are proclaiming the Gospel, we are inviting people to trust in Christ for the rest of their lives. Not a one-time decision where you catch God in some kind of weird salvation contract loophole where you get to go to heaven and then live however you want after. Genuine faith in Christ evidences itself by persevering in faith in Christ. Everybody tracking with me? It's not your perseverance that saves you. It's your perseverance that shows that you have been saved. That you keep trusting in Him and not in yourself. You keep looking to Christ. God's new people are cleansed by the work of Christ. And God's new people persevere in their faith in Christ. And then number three, God's new people produce fruit through Christ. God's new people produce fruit through Christ. Look with me in verse four. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Here's Jesus' argument. A branch can only bear fruit if the life of the vine is flowing through it. 
But if that branch is disconnected from the vine, then it will not be able to bear fruit. I remember a couple summers, uh, summers, a couple falls ago, we went up to North Georgia. That was that fall trip for that year. We went to North Georgia and we went to a, a apple orchard. And uh, man, I mean, does it get any more hallmark than picking apples in North Georgia in the fall? If you cut a branch off of an apple tree before it's time for them to bear fruit, will that branch start bearing fruit by itself? No. It must be connected to the tree if it's going to bear fruit. And so it is with disciples of Christ. This is how good works relate to the Christian life. And I really need you to tune in with me right here, okay, so that you don't misunderstand. Salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone to the glory of God alone. But what does that faith express, or what does it look like for that faith to show itself in real life? It looks like bearing fruit. And it's not fruit that you and I produce. If you hear this morning, I've got to go and do a bunch of good stuff for Jesus in order to be saved, you've totally misunderstood John 15. If anything, John 15 teaches the exact opposite. That apart from Christ, what does He say? You can do nothing. The life of the vine must be pulsating through the branch if that branch is going to bear fruit. That's it. And what does this fruit look like? What does it look like to bear fruit? What does Jesus have in mind when He says that? Look with me in verse 12. He says, This is My commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are My friends if you do what I command you. That's the good fruit that we are called to produce, church. We are called to love each other the way that Christ first loved us. That Jesus willingly laid down His life for us. And so in response, we willingly lay down our lives for one another. That we love each other sacrificially. We care for one another sacrificially. This is the difference between a consumeristic mindset in the life of the church versus a covenantal mindset in the life of the church. The consumeristic mindset says, I'm here, give me the goods. The covenantal mindset says, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of my brother or sister. I'm willing to sacrificially love them, to care for them, even when it means I have to miss my favorite show. Although we live in the age of streaming, so that illustration is no good anymore. You'll say, I'll just stream it later. But it used to be that you would have to miss the show for a whole week. But we, we gladly love one another. And our love for one another is to be shaped by the cross. That is the good fruit that we are called to produce. And the, and the thing about it is, is that you can't do this in and of yourself. This is what Christ does through you. You must be connected to Him by faith if you want to produce that kind of fruit in your life. So... God's new people are cleansed by the work of Christ. We are called to persevere in our faith in Christ. We produce good fruit through Christ. And number four, God's new people enjoy God's blessings because of Christ. We enjoy God's blessings because of Christ. And I'm not talking here health, wealth, general prosperity. That's not what I have in mind when I say the blessings of God. If anything, and we'll see this more next week, Lord willing, if you want to be a disciple of Christ, get ready for a life of suffering. But there are blessings to be had, not just in heaven later, but in this life now for the believer. And here's what those blessings are. When we are cleansed by the work of Christ, and we are persevering in Christ and producing good fruit through Christ, we experience God's blessings Because of Christ. And there are four that we see in our text. Number one is assurance of God's love. Assurance of God's love. Verses 9 through 10. As the Father has loved you, or excuse me, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Notice the order here, church. Again, it's important. Verse 3 
You're already cleansed because of my word. Now abide. Okay? So now we're persevering in our faith in Christ. Verse 10, what does that look like? If you keep my commandments, that commandment to love one another, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. What Jesus is saying here, and I'm not talking about a particular feeling that you might have, your feelings will come and go. But objectively, here's what you can know. And this is what you need to preach to yourself. Is that if I am trusting in Christ, then I know that I am loved by God. Regardless of whatever your emotion might be in the moment, objectively, Christian, you preach this gospel to yourself. Which is that I am trusting in Christ. And in Christ alone. And because of that, I know that I am loved by God. Because it's nothing that I do. It's what Jesus did that is the grounds of God's love for me. Amen? God's love for you doesn't go up and down. His love for you is based at the work of Christ. And so we have assurance of God's love. It is an objective fact of reality. You trust in Christ. You are loved by God. Go and preach that to yourself every day this week. Number two. Answered prayers. Look with me in verses 7 and 8. Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This verse could easily be abused if Jesus only said, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And God becomes, you know, like this blue genie. We get to ask wishes too. But instead, notice what he says on the front end of that. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. You want to know a prayer that God loves to answer in your life? Father, let my life count for the glory of Christ. God, I want to bear fruit for You that brings glory to Your name. God loves to answer those prayers. Father, please help me, God, to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Help me to love them sacrificially. Help me to care for them, to inconvenience myself for them. God, give me the grace to do this. I can't do this apart from You, Lord Jesus. God loves to answer Those kinds of prayers. Pray for fruit in your life. Number three, abundant joy. Abundant joy. Look with me in verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Here's the truth, guys. Everyone in this room right now We are pursuing the good life. We want the good life. That's the default mode of every human being on this planet. And so the question is, what is the good life? And where is it to be found? And many, in fact all of us, have at one point at least, we have sought to find that answer in the world. That the good life must be found in amassing as many material possessions as I can get, or the good life must be found in pursuing pleasure at all costs, whether it be through drugs or whatever. The good life is found in having power. And whenever you say things, people listen to you and they have to do what you say. That's the good life, right? Wrong. What Jesus has just said here is that the good life is not found in any of those things. The good life is found in Christ. And so, brother or sister, listen to me. If your conception of the Christian life this morning, if this is your understanding of what it means to follow Christ, is that you have to stop all the things that you love, all the things that actually make you happy. You have to give all that good stuff up. And then you have to go and do this boring God stuff. Because, well, I mean, it's better than hell in eternity, right? And so I'm going to stop doing the things that I love, and I'm going to have to do the things that I really wish I didn't have to do, but I'm going to do them, and it's drudgery, but I'm going to do it because I want to go to heaven. If that is your view of the Christian life, then you have missed it. You have missed it. 
The good life is not found apart from Christ. The good life is found in Christ. The deepest longings of your heart will not be satisfied in the stuff of this world. The deepest longings of your heart, what you truly yearn for, you want your heart to explode in joy? Come to Christ. He is where true joy is found. I have had more seasons of just this sense of, of, I don't know if this is even a a good term, but just this sense of transcendent joy as I have known Christ. It has been richer and deeper and more satisfying than anything I ever tried to look for in the world. The third blessing is a fullness of joy in Christ. The Christian life is not drudgery. John says this, that we obey His commands and His commands are not burdensome to us. And then number four, friendship with Christ. Look with me in verses 14 and 15. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. The beauty of the Christian life is that we get to know God more and more and more. And He's revealing to us His will and He's revealing to us His heart. To know God and to be known by God. This is the soul's quest and it is satisfied in Christ. Jesus is the true vine and His people are the branches. God's new people in Christ are, first of all, cleansed by the work of Christ. And everything else in our lives flows from His cross. And those who have been truly cleansed will evidence this by their perseverance in Christ. They will trust Christ once and then they will keep on trusting in Him. And as they remain in Christ, they will bear good fruit. The good fruit of sacrificially loving one another. And in so doing, they experience God's blessings because of Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank You. God, that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Because Father, if we're honest with ourselves, we've already recognized that truth. That we cannot bear fruit apart from a vital connection to Christ by faith. And we thank You, Lord Jesus, that it is through Your life pulsating through us that we then bear fruit for You. And so, Father, we pray that by Your grace, individually and corporately, that we would bear fruit for Christ. Fruit that would be pleasing to You and that would bring You glory. And God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing in response. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. This morning comes from Revelation 19, uh, verses 4 through 8. And church, this is a vision of who we are actually. This is who we will become because of the work of Christ. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, you who fear Him, small and great. 
Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And why is it that we have those righteous deeds, church? It began with the work of Christ. Amen. Until that time, church, until Revelation 19 is like our reality, what are we going to do? For every look to self? Amen. I love you, church. Go and commend Christ to others.